Hey, everybody. Welcome back to C4C Apologetics. I'm your host, Danny. And today we have another special guest. It's someone that personality wise uh, really seems like me. Uh, I don't want to say a little older. You might be like five years older than me, but I really like this guy's personality. I've heard him speak in person. I've listened to him. I've read his works and I just like well, you'll find out why. You'll find out why in this interview. Great guy. He's the academic dean and professor of theology at Grace School of Theology. And so if you're looking for a university, a college, a seminary, a biblical school to go to uh, for different degree programs, go ahead and check them out. I know a couple of people that are actually currently enrolled in the Grace School of Theology. Excellent free grace seminary and college. So uh, we have today Dr. Fred Shea. And so, uh, Fred, just thank you for being with us. Could you elaborate just a little bit? Anything about yourself, who you are, what you do, hobbies? Uh, could you just let our people know who you are? Well, Dan, it is a joy to be here. Um, glad to be back. And um, yeah, I'm I'm uh, married. I've got two grown children and one grandchild. I've been uh, teaching in seminaries for the last 30 years or so. And before that, I was a pastor. So I've kind of worked on both sides of that. And way before that, in the dark ages, I uh, used to work in the San Francisco Probation Department. So I think I have a feel for what we call human depravity. Yeah. So uh, anyway, so pastor, seminary professor, family guy, hobbies. I don't really have too many hobbies, um, but I try to root for football and I used to root for Alabama, but what the heck? <laughs> you talk about you don't have any hobbies. I see a lot of books behind you right now. <laughs> well, that's reading. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a hobby. <laughs> it's work. It's fun for me. <laughs> so let me ask you this question real quick. Uh, you, you mentioned you're a pastor, you were a pastor and you've been uh, teaching for uh, 30 some years. Is there a difference really between teaching and preaching within a in a church setting as a pastor and teaching in a university professor setting? I think so. I think in preaching, you usually are trying to keep the, the, the main point, the main point, and you're focused on the big idea. Mm -hmm. Dr. Haddon Robinson used to teach homiletics, and he said, you want to focus on the big idea. Mm -hmm. Number two, I think you want to bring some passion to that discussion because you're trying to motivate and move people in a direction. Right. Now in teaching, I think you might cover broader, a broader spectrum. You probably want to give more options and help people become educated, not indoctrinated and mm -hmm. help them understand the full range of, op of options that are available on the topic. You, you still can be passionate, right. but you probably are spending a little more time on the logical reasonableness of arguments as mm -hmm. you make information known to people. But they're connected for me, at least. Yeah. Would there be a difference between teaching in a church as a pastor and teaching in the college? For me, no. The only difference is the people I teach in our Sunday school class, they don't get an exam at the end. But they, <laughs> they, are, they are seeing and listening to a lot of the same material. Yeah. I might not use as much language material because they don't have the background for that. Mm -hmm. But other than that, they're they're getting a pretty high, you know, a very similar lecture, yeah. a similar handout. Uh, they just don't have to take an exam. They don't have to know Greek. OK, uh, that makes sense. But um, I expect I expect more from teachers in the church. Yeah. What do you expect more of? I expect us to speak more relevantly, more deeply, more theologically. Uh, my fear is that the local church has watered everything down because they want to make sure everybody's happy. So we need to make sure we have a fog machine and we need to bring out the Christian dancing bears and the jugglers for Jesus and yeah. make everybody happy. My job isn't to make anybody happy. It's to help inform them with the importance of the word of God and let the spirit of God illuminate truth to them that they might be a different person. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, when I said that I like his personality and we're very similar this is what I'm talking about. There's a passion. There's a desire for truth and explaining truth and exegeting the truth, the relevance in the culture, and not turn into this emergent church, this progressive church, or this just seeker-sensitive movement. It's all about if this is the special revelation of God and it's all truth, we need to be well to articulate it, to know it, to defend it, and to just equip others with it. And so... Yeah, I love that about you, Dr. Shea. Well, today we're going to be talking a little bit about free grace theology and really how can we engage people within for free grace theology and explain a little bit. But before we actually get into the meat of the interview, 
Could you let us know, how did you personally get involved in what's known as free grace theology? Well, that's an interesting story. I, I became a Christian and started listening to Dr. Ray Stedman and mm -hmm. Dr. John MacArthur. And I oh, listened yeah. and knew both of them and listened to them and believed everything they said. And in fact, I had the opportunity to go to seminary. I was going to Fuller Seminary and realized it was a little bit, um, shall we say, moving in a more liberal perspective. So I ended up going to Dallas Seminary. And at that time, I totally held to lordship salvation because that's what John MacArthur held to. And how and many I, years ago was that? Well, that's about 42, 43 years ago. Okay. Yeah. So then I was exposed to some free grace teaching through the through people like uh, Zane Hodges, mm -hmm. Charles Ryrie, Dwight Pentecost, Elliot Johnson, Roy Zook. And mm -hmm. I began to realize that I had a fundamental flaw in my exegesis and the resulting theology. So as I studied and thought, I finally came to the point, you know, I need to, I need to realize what's going on here. So I ended up writing my, uh, my thesis in the Masters of Theology course. It's a four-year program. You have to write a thesis. So I wrote it on Lordship Salvation as taught by John MacArthur. Mm -hmm. And this is before any of his books were written. And I had known him and I'd interviewed him numbers of times. So this is really an important issue to me. And so I finally wrote that. And Dr. Um, Craig Glickman and Zane Hodges were my readers. Mm -hmm. And I, I really kind of turned towards a free grace perspective. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of continued over the years as I read and thought and taught and, and um, hadn't changed. Now, from, from what I remember, when you spoke at the Octo October Free Grace Alliance Conference as a plenary speaker, you made mention that, like you just said, MacArthur hadn't written any books yet, right? Right. But did John MacArthur get an idea to write a book about something? Oh, yeah. I remember <laughs> he, he and I are having breakfast uh, in Dallas. He was there for the Christian Booksellers Convention, and we got together for breakfast. And so he was very kind and gracious with his time with me over the years. And so we were talking. I gave him a final copy of the thesis. I want yeah. to make sure that everything I wrote was, was good for him. And, and he read it, and he said, Everything you said is exactly what I believe. You've been very fair and honest with me. And he said to me, you know, I think I ought to write a book on this. And a few years later, <laughs> out comes this wonderful book of his, The Gospel According to Jesus. So, uh, yeah, I think I might have helped move him along because hmm. he saw the severity of the issue. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> when you when you mentioned that at the conference, I was just I was chuckling, but I love that. So I do you have a response to gospel according to Jesus? Um, well, you know, I think he he wrote it after spending so many years in the book of Matthew. Uh -huh. And that's what really formulated his viewpoint of his mm -hmm. soteriology. Yeah. Uh, that plus being pushed more and more towards reformed theological perspectives. Yeah. So um, Dr. MacArthur is a very um, good, honest man. He loves the Lord. He loves the church and he has served mm -hmm. the church well for mm -hmm. many, many years. Yeah. I just think he's a little bit off in this area of his right. soteriology. Yeah. No, I, I'm sorry. I just had to draw that out real quick. So I remember that. But so you collaborated with a few other people like Dr. Dillo and some others on in, a, in defense of free grace theology book. And at the end of the last chapter, you had a final plea. And in there, uh, you referenced Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 19, where Paul mentions it is needful for there to be divisions within the church. Could you elaborate on your thoughts on what Paul meant by that and what how it applies to today? Well, I believe contextually, Paul was writing to the Corinthians. And as mm -hmm. you know, he wrote three letters. And the two we have are pretty scathing, and I bet the third one was just as bad. Right. But he, he wrote these letters trying to correct the Corinthians in a variety of issues. Mm -hmm. uh, they had problems with sexuality. They had problems with the Lord's Supper. They had problems uh, being kind to one another. Mm -hmm. There was drunkenness. They, there was immorality, the types that even the pagans weren't involved with. So this is a church that had a lot of problems. And so Paul wrote to them to help correct the problems. One mm -hmm. of the problems was that people wanted to be leaders. People wanted them to follow me and follow mm -hmm. me and do what I do. Right. And, and so they were articulating all sorts of divisive uh, doctrinal error. And so Paul says, 
listen, it looks to me like in this case, it's essential that there be, the word is division, but the word in Greek is the word heretic. Mm -hmm. Why is it important? Paul right. says, so that those of you who are approved might be made manifest. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a problem in the church, you need to acknowledge there's a problem so you can start fixing the problem. And so that is how I think Paul meant it there. Now, if we extrapolate the principle right. and we say, sometimes it's helpful if someone who has a divergent view, someone mm -hmm. who has a divisive view needs to be put on the table so we can analyze it, evaluate it, and then decide what to do with it. I don't, I have no problem with doing that in the church. If somebody comes up with an idea and it's gaining speed and people are buying into it, but it's biblically wrong, let's mm -hmm. get it on the table, examine it, evaluate it, and clarify it to help feed, lead, and protect the flock. Because that's what pastors do. They feed, mm -hmm. lead, protect the flock. Right. Well, you can't feed them and lead them and protect them if you don't know what you're feeding, leading, and protecting them from. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if there's a new heresy out there, let's get it on the table. Let's look at it. What's good about it? What's bad about it? Where did it come from? Where's it going to lead us to? What are the implications of it? How is it unbiblical? We need to do that so that the truth might be made manifest. All right. That makes a lot of sense. And you mentioned that it comes from the original word of a heretic. And, and I think you've somewhat already defined what that is, obviously, in what you just said. But uh, could you elaborate in today's vernacular and situation? Sure. What is a heretic today? And at what point do you believe somebody crosses that line? And when they do, I'm sorry, it's a threefold question. How do we handle it? What do we do with it? Well, you know, like most words, they kind of change over time. Okay. So right. the word division or heretic mm -hmm. or heresy these days has taken on a very non-technical idea. We mm -hmm. think of anybody who doesn't agree with me as a heretic. That's mm -hmm. how we tend to use the word. That's true. Or we think of some way out dude out there. Oh, that's, that's heresy. He's crazy. Right. But that's not actually what the word means. Let me give you a technical meaning from Alistair McGrath, theologian at Oxford. Yeah, yeah. He says, heresy is best seen as a form of Christian belief that more by accident than design ultimately ends up subverting, destabilizing, or even destroying the core of Christian faith. So heresy, technically, historically, has come from inside the church as it's tried to deal with a historical doctrine, mm -hmm. oftentimes around the deity of Christ, the humanity of Christ, the nature of Christ, the personhood of Christ. Mm -hmm. So it now doesn't have to be all Christology, right. but in the early days of the church, that's what they fought over. But the heretic came from inside the church trying to explain orthodoxy, but they explained it in an unorthodox way. Mm -hmm. What did the early church do? They went back to the scripture, they formed councils, they made decisions, and they would say this is false teaching or this is heretical because it's divisive. Right. It's harming the church. Now, what do we do with that today? Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes into church and they're teaching a teaching X, whatever X is, right. and it's significantly going against what we believe the Bible teaches mm -hmm. about, let's say, the deity of Christ, um, what do we do with that? Well, we say, let's make sure we get the truth out there. Let's clarify what the issue is. Mm -hmm. Let's clarify what the Bible says about it. Let's confirm that the person articulating it is actually articulating it. And if all of those things are true, mm -hmm. then we have to say, my friend, this teaching is not orthodox. Here is why it's not orthodox, and we don't allow you to teach it in the church. We don't allow you to be a teacher in the right. church. And so if what they're teaching goes against your doctrinal statement, if what they're teaching is harmful to the spiritual lives of the people, I think at that point you ask them to leave. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I do want to go ahead and ask a question a little earlier than planned. Uh, when you had mentioned that aspect as far as sit down with them, see what they actually believe about this teaching, this topic, let them explain it. 
I want to jump into uh, covenant theology. Mm-hmm. Okay. I want to jump into that because I think that's a great segue because when I've started learning, I've been watching a lot of debates lately and I've been listening to a lot of uh, Lordship people and how they try to understand certain passages. And it seems like they have a totally different hermeneutic. And because of that, they're arriving at like polar opposite understandings of passages. Could you explain a little bit the difference, at least from the interpretive standpoint, the difference between dispensationalists and covenant theology, and how can we effectively engage those that hold to covenant theology when they have a different hermeneutic? Does that make sense? Sure. The, the first, uh, you've already mentioned the big issue. The big issue is their hermeneutic. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now, I'm, when I talk about covenant theology or reform theology, or mm-hmm. the latest extrapolation of it is called progressive covenantalism. Okay. All of all of those would be put under kind of a covenant theology perspective. When I talk about those, I'm talking about conservative evangelicals who hold to covenant or reform theology. Okay. Mm-hmm. So those kinds of people have a very good hermeneutic when they're studying the Apostle Paul when they're studying the Apostle John, or maybe Peter. Mm -hmm. But when they start studying prophecy, then all of a sudden, their hermeneutic changes. It becomes more spiritualized, not allegorical, but they spiritualize certain things. So one of the issues with Reformed theology is they believe in covenants. That's why it's called covenant theology. Mm-hmm. They believe in the, the covenant of redemption, the covenant of works, the covenant of grace. Mm-hmm. But the problem is those three are not in the Bible. We're, look up, where does it say the covenant of works, right. the covenant of redemption? Those are theological. They're not exegetical. Dispensationalists focus on exegetically clear covenants, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, Mm -hmm. the new covenant. We look at those as the biblical covenants. That's the spine that holds together the the skeleton of the Bible. Mm -hmm. We take those covenants literally. Those covenants lead you to believe that what God has promised to Israel, he will one day fulfill it. So from a dispensational perspective, we look at Romans, say, 9, 10, and 11, Mm -hmm. and we believe that God has temporarily judging Israel and bringing in the church, but that God is going to one day regraft Israel and bless them again. Now, covenant theology says, no, the church replaces Israel. So all of those promises to Abraham are fulfilled in Christ. And if you're a Christian, you're in Christ. Therefore, the Abrahamic promises are fulfilled in Christ and the Christian and the church. Therefore, there's no future for the nation of Israel. Or they take 1 Peter 2, where Peter says, you're a chosen race, a holy, pre-, you know, all those words to Israel. And, and the covenant theologian would say, all of that is now applied to the church. There's no future for the nation of Israel. Therefore, If you believe that, then when you come to the prophetic scripture, you're not looking for it to be literally fulfilled in the nation of Israel. You simply look for it to be filled spiritually in the church. So that's your major difference. It's hermeneutical in terms of its function. Theologically, it sees no future for the nation of Israel, but that the church replaces the nation. So there's a lot of alarming teachings that come out of that with uh, amillennialism and then the fact on a rise of anti-Semitism and not seeing the need or a purpose of the Jewish people. And we're seeing a rise of anti-Semitism, too. But my- however, however, though, I yeah. would not I would not want to connect to say if you're amillennial, you're going to be anti-Semitic. I would sure. not do that. No, you, uh-uh. it, it is true. There's a rise in anti Semitism, and there is a rise in amillennialism, but I would not say there's a cause effect, although you're right, some mm-hmm. go that direction, right. but not De- all. Definitely. And so if if you have, though, the reform, the covenant, uh, trying to spiritualize prophecy, trying to interpret scripture completely different from a proper dispensational hermeneutic, 
what advice would you give when we're trying to engage those people to help them see more accurately? So a little story. When I was going to school at Fuller Seminary, there was a special guest speaker. His name was R.C. Sproul. <laughs> And I remember walking down a road with R.C. Sproul, talking to him about eschatology. And he looked at me and he said, you know, I've been a premillennial and I've been an amillennial and I've been a postmillennial, but I've never been a dispensationalist. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> and I said, well, what do you believe? He says, I don't know what I believe now. Well, he later became a preterist. Oh. which means everything happened in the past. It's already been fulfilled, at least a partial preterist. But I found it interesting because I said, well, what are you teaching? Well, I'm teaching eschatology. But here he wasn't even sure exactly what he believed, which is kind of interesting. Wow. Um, the way I think we deal with these folks uh -huh. is very simple. We, we ask them to sit down and say, okay, let's look at your presuppositions with your hermeneutics. Mm -hmm. Let's look at your presuppositions with your covenants. Once we get those on the table, and I get mine on the table, right? right? Got to get them all on the table. Uh, we then simply look at Ephesians chapter one and chapter three, where Paul talks about the dispensations of time when he talks about ages. Yep. All of a sudden, even the even an amillennialist believes in two dispensations. In fact, Burkhoff says, uh, Lewis Burkhoff in his theology book says there are two dispensations. We call them the Old and the New Testament, mm -hmm. but they are the Old Dispensation and the New. So he believes in two. Yeah. Well, that that's really the the hard part. You know, I really appreciate the aspect of having to lay down presuppositions because everybody carries presuppositions. Everybody mm -hmm. has those biases when they come to Scripture. The problem is always going to be, are we willing to challenge them? And I like what you mentioned as far as trying to take their presuppositions and the covenants and just going to scripture. Where do you see the covenant of grace? Let, let's just have a, let's not argue about it in debate. Let's just look at it together. And, and maybe it's a fact of, uh, I think it's uh, Greg Kokel's book in Tactics, a game plan for discussion Christian convictions. And the fact that one of the best ways is getting people to challenge their own beliefs individually. Because if I try to make someone challenge their belief, they're going to have a wall up. But if I get them to internally question their own self, they're going to be more apt to changing their views. And so trying to sort of poke holes and, and cause fractures, if you will, into foundations. And so I like how you mentioned their hermeneutic and their covenants aspect. Uh, as far as free grace theology, there's a lot of people that are antagonistic to uh, free grace theology, if you will. And in doing so, there's a lot of logical fallacies that people commit when they're trying to argue against free grace theology. Could you explain what are logical fallacies and what are some of the most common that people levy against free grace? Well, a logical fallacy is basically a, a, a misuse of logic. And one of them would be like creating a straw man. And that would be like saying, oh, well, you and free grace don't believe in holiness, you don't believe in dealing with sin, and you're not serious about walking with God. I, and I would say, where did you hear that? Right. You certainly didn't hear that from one of the 500 books that I've read by free grace people. Well, that's what they created. It's a straw man. Some of the uh, logical fallacies also just have to do with the idea that, well, free grace theology is new, therefore it's wrong. Well, wait a minute. Reform theology is relatively new, right? 500 years. So maybe it's wrong and Roman Catholicism is right. right. And they say, well, free grace theology, it started with Darby, right? Maybe in 19, uh, 1890s or whatever. Yeah. No, it started with Paul, actually, but yeah. and Jesus. But apart from that, um, they, they would say, well, nobody else has ever interpreted the Bible this way. Therefore, it's probably not correct. I remember in a very good book by D.A. Carson called mm -hmm. Exegetical Fallacies. The book is very, very helpful. But one of the statements he said when he was writing about Zane Hodges and Hodges' interpretation of James chapter 2, he said, Hodges is probably wrong just because nobody else ever thought of this. Now, number one, 
that's not that's a logical fallacy in and of itself. That's an mm -hmm. exegetical fallacy. And number two, it's a historical fallacy because Hodges isn't the first one to have thought of this. Yeah. So Dr. Carson did not do his homework historically, and he's he's actually committing an exegetical fallacy while he writes a book about exegetical fallacies, which is somewhat kind of interesting. <laughs> that's ironic. Very ironic. So uh, those are some of the problems I think we find in terms of a fallacy. Um, the other one is, well, you guys in the free grace movement, your books aren't published by Zondervan or Erdman's, so yeah. they're not scholarly. Right. Okay, well, they may not be scholarly, but not being published by Zondervan doesn't mean they're not scholarly. I mean, Wayne Grudem once said to me that our books are not good because they haven't had peer review and they're not published by a major publisher. Well, Zondervan actually published Zane Hodge's book absolutely free. Mm. And that's a major publisher. But I mean, so I understand Dr. Grudem's point. Yes, you want peer review. You want some editors looking through it. Mm -hmm. However, we have published some books that are actually pretty high level. But I guess that's a subjective decision. But those are the examples of... of uh, fallacies that people make and argue against free grace theology, I think. So with people that are antagonistic to free grace theology, how can we be used to reach them for the message? Well, I think you pray. I've been praying for Dr. MacArthur and Dr. Grudem for many, many years. I think you prepare, you do your homework, you learn, you read, you mm -hmm. think, you evaluate, and then you proceed. And depending on the open doors that you have, you proceed. For me, I got to proceed by talking with Dr. MacArthur. I got to proceed by talking with Dr. Grudem, teaching with him and talking with him for 10 years about these issues. I got to proceed by writing books, editing books about this or speaking to it. Other people, they write books and they take the opportunity that they get. So you pray, you do your preparation, and then you proceed with the opportunities that the Lord gets gives you. Um, let's face it, not everybody's going to change their mind. Right. And the more you write and the more famous you are, the more difficult it is to change your mind because you'll look foolish. People don't want to look foolish. That's true. I have to ask you, are you a Baptist? Because you just had a three-point outline right there. I am not a Baptist. <laughs> I've never been a Baptist. I've always been a Bible church guy. Oh, there we go. Bible but I know guy. some Baptists, and David Allen's a great preacher, and he uses three-point outlines. Well, now you know a second Baptist right here. So. There we go. <laughs> At least in denominational name. But, there we go. No, I, I, I do appreciate that. Uh, could you explain, okay, so say within the church we have younger, newer believers. They're trying to understand theology. What role would you say free grace theology and its tenets plays within discipleship and discipling a new convert? Yeah, I think there is a theological clarification and classification that has to be communicated to young Christians. Okay. And probably to old Christians too, unfortunately. But it's this. There is a fundamental distinction between justification and sanctification. There is a fundamental distinction between the establishing of a relationship with Jesus mm -hmm. and experiencing fellowship with Jesus. There's a fundamental distinction between establishing my position in Christ and the condition that I live in as a Christian. Mm -hmm. Now, all three of those are those three categories. They're all saying the same thing. Theologically, what they're saying is I am justified by faith and I am sanctified by faithfulness. Hmm. I don't work to earn justification, but I do good works to grow in my sanctification. Disciples need to understand that fundamental distinction. It is fundamental. It is foundational. And if you don't keep those two separated, then they get ever so closer and they get mixed and if they get too mixed, you end up with the Roman Catholic Church. Mm. So you got to keep them separated. The reform movement tends to bump them together. The Catholics bend them over. Mm -hmm. 
the Council of Trent makes it very clear, you are saved by good works. If you don't believe that, you are anathema. Mm -hmm. The Reformed Church would never say that. They would say you're saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. Right. Therefore, good works must be there, but they're not the ground of your justification. They're the evidence of your justification. And with that, you just destroyed any other, any doctrine of assurance, because now it's all predicated upon how well you live. Now, that is important for discipleship of a young Christian, because if they're examining their navel every day going, am I good enough? Have I done enough good works? Do I feel enough love for God? Right. Total subjectivity. No, no, no. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me has passed from death to life and will never come into judgment, period. That's where my assurance is. It's in the words of Jesus. It's what he did for me, not what I do for him. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> there was one thing that we mentioned last night uh, when I was trying to give a message on the importance of why interpretation matters. Because in my my understanding and experience, our interpretation drives our application. And our application influences our behavior. And so if we if we understand how to interpret correctly, then we can apply correctly and it changes our behavior or allows us to act certain ways. And if we take a lordship salvation position, then we're going to apply it to our life, examine ourselves, whether we're in the faith, like you were saying, and that's going to change my behavior psychologically. I'm going to be like, well, am I a Christian? Why well, did this today? And you're never going to have that assurance. And so uh, I really appreciate your explanation on the difference between justification and sanctification and how marrying them two up can really damage somebody in their, really in their psyche and their day-to-day -day living and their behavior. Uh, uh, let me recommend to your audience, there's a book called Relationship and Fellowship, and it's by Dr. Dave Anderson. There's another book called Position and Condition, and it's by Dr. Dave Anderson. And both of these books look at those categories through different books in the Bible. There's a third book by Dr. Charlie Bing called Grace Disciple or Salvation Discipleship. Um, and it's it does the same thing, looking at different mm -hmm. biblical passages through the New Testament. All three of those books will be fabulous to deal with what I what I just said. All right. So we're going to have links to those books in the description below. Are they all for, uh, Grace Theology Press books? Uh, they are all Grace Theology Press books, and they're all available on Amazon. OK, so we will link them there. I do want to ask a practical question is really stems off of uh your your message at the conference in October. So at the conference, you mentioned you had a concern about what I believe was a free grace pastor mm -hmm. who ended up having a, a very prominent lordship individual, not only in their church, but ending up, if I'm not mistaken, on their leadership team, on their board as an elder. Couple questions. Number one, could you explain why that's a problem? But number two, a pastor like myself and many others of us out there, when we're looking at people within the church and they're faithful members, and they have a heart to seek God, to serve God, to join with the, their congregation here in unity, what advice would you give us pastors if we see somebody like that, but they are very much a lordship, reform, Arminian, whatever, how, how would we be able to have conversations? What should we do in that situation without having them cast out of the church or them running away, you know, ruin the relationship? Do you understand that second part of the question I'm trying to get at? I think I do. All right. So can you explain why it's a problem <clears throat> and then what practical advice would you give us? Well, first of all, this is a good reason why your church should have a very clear, detailed doctrinal statement. Evidently, um, people who don't believe fundamental truths that a church holds to can sign a doctrinal statement mm -hmm. because the doctrinal statement does not make clear what those fundamental commitments are. The illustration you're using is here's a church that's a free grace, dispensational, non-charismatic church. Mm -hmm. But here's a man who is a lordship salvationist, covenant theologian, um, charismatic. And he is able to sign the doctrinal statement of that church. Well, the whole problem could have been eliminated if the doctrinal statement made it clear what they actually believe. 
Now, what's the danger when this happens? Mm -hmm. Infiltration, contamination, and elimination. Mm -hmm. When somebody comes in, they're not coming in to do nothing. They're coming in to persuade people. So people in the church get persuaded, and they now no longer believe in dispensationalism. They now no longer believe in non-charismaticism. Mm -hmm. They now no longer believe in free grace theology. They now believe in charismatic reformed theology mm -hmm. with an anti-free grace perspective. Mm -hmm. That's why you don't want them in. You're not saying they're a bad person. You're simply right. saying, why would you want to come to church here? Why would you want to be a member here and put yourself under the leadership of a pastor who doesn't agree with you? And then why would you want to be the elder of a church that totally disagrees with you in your soteriology and your eschatology and your pneumatology? Right. I, I don't. I'm not going to speculate as to anybody's motives. Mm -hmm. I don't know motives. All I know is that certainly looks strange to me. I don't, I, I can only come up with certain conclusions, but I can't prove them. But it doesn't look like a smart thing to me. And that's what I told the senior pastor. I wanted to clarify, are you still free grace? Are you a dispensational? Are you non-charismatic? To which he mm -hmm. said, yes. I said, then why in the world do you want somebody who's against all those things, not only against them, wrote a book right. specifically against everything you believe in that theological category? Why do you think he wants to be a member and sit under your teaching? Why does he want to be an elder and, and be under your leadership with him? Right. And the answer was, well, I think we have it under control. Okay. Uh, that That's all I can do. I can ask the question. I can challenge the response. And then you have to move on. Um, the answer to solving the problem would have been, number one, a doctoral statement that made it impossible for somebody to be a member when they didn't agree with the fundamental soteriological conviction of the church. Right. Char charismaticism is a secondary issue. Mm -hmm. Eschatology is vital. But it's a secondary issue. But soteriology, that is a primary issue. Yeah. So that's one of those 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen. 19. It's mm -hmm. good that there are heresies among you, that those who are approved might be made manifest. So it goes back to a church's uh, 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 policy, doctrine, doctrinal statements, constitutions. So like if somebody were want to join a particular church, Give them a copy of the Constitution, doctrinal statement, make sure they agree with them. If they don't, talk it out. But by joining the church, they're in agreement with the position, the soteriology, the eschatology, whatever that doctrinal statement says. And then they can get voted in for membership or however the individual church governance is. And then from there, look at, OK, leadership positions. But they've already agreed upon uh, the church's positions on certain aspects. And if they were to stray, then that's where you could go ahead and have more discussions as far as, okay, why are you straying from this? And no, we can't have you on a leadership because of X, Y, or Z. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it also goes back to a pastor's requirement to lead, feed, and protect. Like Exactly. I still think you're a Baptist deep down. I mean, you've had four three bullet point outlines already, so... <laughs> Well, I think this is why I think we need more in our doctoral statements. And I would add the whole sexual revolution. I think in our doctoral statements, yep. we need clear statements. What, what we believe about family, yep. what we believe about homosexuality, what we believe about transgender. Mm -hmm. We can't leave that open-ended. We need to say, this is what we believe. Mm -hmm. And if you're a member here, you agree with these statements. That doesn't mean you're being homophobic. It doesn't mean you're being mean. Right. It means you're being biblical and faithful to God's word. And my goal is to be faithful to God's word, not to make somebody happy on the Amen. outside. Amen. Amen. Yes, yes, and yes. All right. So I do want to ask you one or two questions. Really, I want to ask this question that has a variance of opinion uh, interpretation within free grace theology. And it's really getting into something that I've really looked at, wrestled with, and trying to fully understand. Is there a difference between entering the kingdom of God and inheriting the kingdom of God? Is there a difference? If so, do all Christians enter, but only some inherit? 
if there is not a difference, does it mean that those who don't practice sin will be saved? Galatians 5.21. So is there a difference between inheriting the kingdom and entering the kingdom? Because I think that has to play with how we look at soteriology. So it seems to me within the free grace movement in general, there's an agreement that when you become a Christian, you have eternal life and we believe eternal security. So every Christian will enter into the kingdom of God. That means Christians will have a glorified body, resurrected body mm -hmm. to rule and reign with Christ in the kingdom. So all Christians will enter it. Now the question is, well, what about inheriting it? That's different. That is predicated upon reward. So all Christians enter, but not all Christians inherit at the same level or okay. the same degree. Or if you have a cup, you can get an eight ounce cup, a 12 ounce cup, a big guzzler or a Dixie cup, fill them to the top. They're all full, 100% full, but they all have a different capacity. Hmm. All Christians will be happy and ruling with Christ, but we will all have a different capacity. I think this may be what Peter gets at in 1 Peter 1.11, when he says, if you practice these things, you will have an abundant entrance into the kingdom mm. of God. Abundant yeah. entrance. Now, everybody will enter, but some will have an abundant entrance. Mm -hmm. I take it that is the idea of inheriting more. This would lead us then into Bema Seat theology, mm -hmm. where at the Bema Seat, 1 Corinthians 5, or 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10, Romans 14, and then other places, we will stand before the Lord, he will evaluate our life, and he will reward us, and then give us a role in the kingdom. This would be tied into Revelation 2 and 3 in the concept of the overcomer. Mm -hmm. To those who overcome, they will be given a reward. To rule with my heavenly Father, in Revelation uh, chapter 2, verse 26, mm -hmm. Jesus was faithful. If we're faithful, we'll be given the right to rule with him. But that's only to those who overcome and are faithful. Not all Christians overcome. Not all Christians are faithful. Not every Christian became a martyr and died for their faith. There were plenty of cowards. Right. Paul talks about those who will stand before the Lord and all of their works are burned up. All, even if that's a literary device, all, all right. and yet they will be saved so as through fire. Now, there's three passages in Ephesians, Galatians, mm -hmm. and 1 Corinthians 6 that talk about where Paul, same author, talking to a Christian audience, mm -hmm. exhorting the audience and telling them that those who practice such behavior shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're reformed, you say, aha, if a person who says they're a Christian practices these sins, that proves they're not a Christian and they go to hell. Arminian theology would say, no, no, there's a real Christian, but now they're practicing those sins. They lose their eternal life and they go to hell. But then the free grace side says, no, no, there's a real believer, but he's really sinning, and he won't come away from it. And at the Bema seat, he will forfeit his reward. He will not inherit the kingdom as a Christian in a glorified body to serve Jesus. So that's the typical way we look at that, inheritance and entrance differential. No, I like how you put that. Uh, I definitely believe that there's there's this misunderstanding as far as what the judgment seat of Christ is actually going to be like. So when people hear, oh, you know, we're going to have a, a loss of rewards, you're going to have a loss of rewards. You might you might even hear from Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, you know, you wicked servant, you know, because you didn't serve properly. But they don't think that's enough. And I think a lot of people have this misunderstanding on how much regret there will be at that judgment seat of Christ when an unfaithful Christian loses all those rewards. And so I don't want to say that 
a Christian's going to live with condemnation forever. By no means do, is that what I want to say. But would you agree with me that there's this there's this lack of understanding the 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 amount of importance of that judgment seat and how emotions will be tied into it? Do you know what I mean? I think I think there is a lack of understanding for that because we tend to think, oh no, there's no more tears. Right. Well, that's true, but not then. Thank you. That's not true then. That's true after the millennial kingdom. So in, when you're looking at the Bema seat, some people say the, law, the, the sadness is simply the loss of reward, but you keep all the rewards you get, mm -hmm. but you lose some. Okay. Others hold to what's called punitive damage. Mm -hmm. There's not only loss of reward, there is punishment mm -hmm. for your evil. Mm -hmm. The third group is what's called kingdom exclusion. If your sins are so great, you're excluded from living in the kingdom, although you will live out in eternity. You're, you're still redeemed. You're still saved. But your punishment is not being able to participate at all in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So you have three views of the Bema Seat. But all three, and all three realize the significance of the event. Right. It is important. In, in Reformed theology, usually from an all-mill perspective, the the millennial kingdom is spiritualized. So mm -hmm. there is no thousand years. Well, what happens before the thousand years begin is the Bema seat judgment. Mm -hmm. What happens at the end of the millennial kingdom? The great mm -hmm. white throne judgment. Yep. If you don't have a millennial, millennial kingdom, those are brought together. And all of a sudden, you're talking about both things with the same voice. Right. And that's a real problem. I remember Dr. Moo, Doug Moo, came to a seminary where I was teaching, Phoenix Seminary, and he was talking about his new book on Galatians to the faculty, and we were interacting with him, and I asked Dr. Moo, I said, so tell me, what exactly then is the severity of the judgment at the Bema seat in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10? He said, oh, that's hell. That's hell. And I said, I, I you know, nobody said anything. I'm looking around. I went, no, no, I, I mean the Bema seat. Oh, yeah, that's hell. That's hell. And Dr. Grudem, who was sitting right next to me, he said, well, Doug, Doug Moo, Doug, isn't it possible that that's a reward for faithful Christians? And Dr. Moo said, oh, no, 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 it's way too severe for that. That's not it at all. Well, that's because there's no millennium. And then the, the Bema seat judgment is combined with the great white throne judgment. Mm -hmm. And they're put together. And now you got all kinds of silly talk going on. Right. That's a problem. And that goes right back to the views of Reformed and Covenant theology and their hermeneutic, like you're saying, and how they look at prophecy. Yes. So you, you clearly explained you, your views on the difference between entering and inheriting the kingdom of God and the millennial kingdom, if you will. In Matthew chapter 19, verse number 29, I do want to read that real quick. Get your thoughts on it. Because from my study, the word, the terminology entering the kingdom doesn't occur after Acts uh, I agree with you as far as the difference between entering and inheriting. I sort of equate it to uh, if you're a friend of mine, you can enter my house if I invite you. You know, your friend, you have access to every room that I give you access to. But if I die and you inherit my house, not only can you enter, but now you can rule it. And so there's a bit of a distinction there. But one verse has always caused me a little bit of questions. And in Matthew 19, 29, I just read from the King James, and it says, And every one of you that has forsaken... Uh, houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my namesake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Uh, could you explain that? And apparently my video has went out. So there you go. Oh, yeah. What does it mean to inherit everlasting life? Now, let's make sure we see the next verse. Good point. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Mm-hmm. So here is Jesus speaking, and he's talking about inheriting eternal life, and he's talking about the reality that some people who are last in this world are going to be first in the world to come. And those who are first in this world, the Pharisees, are going to be last in the world to come. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, what does it mean that you inherit eternal life? I thought you become a Christian by faith alone. And that's it. Right. Well, let's re let's remember 
eternal life can have both a qualitative and a quantitative element or aspect to it. So if it's quantity, that's duration. If it's quality, that's reward. Mm. In fact, over in the book of Galatians chapter 6, Paul essentially says the same thing. He says in verse 7, do not be do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for what, wherever, whatever a man sows, this he shall also reap. Right. For the one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. Mm -hmm. He was just talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Right. He's now talking about what you sow, you're going to receive from. Well, he says, reap eternal life. Yes, not in a durational period, but in a quality period. It's a quality issue. So you, you, you inherit eternal life if eternal life is a quality of existence. That is predicated upon faithfulness, which results in reward. So that's how I would look at the Matthew 19. I'd correlate it with the same thing that Paul's saying in Galatians 6, 8. Um, it's also connected to Mark chapter 10, verse 30. He says the same thing. It's being faithful, you will inherit a quality of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's how I do it. Would it make sense then, because like in John chapter 3, you know, John 3, 16, you know, for God love the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes us him uh, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Yep. Uh, what, would it be safe to say that the references to present tense eternal life have to do with uh, positional sanctification or justification and the passages that speak of getting shall have, you know, like in Matthew 19, 29, shall inherit a, a future aspect that that's talking about the qual qualitative or the quantitative, if you will. Would that be safe to assume that the present tense passages deal with justification and the future tense passages have to deal with uh, rewards, if you will? Off the top, I would say, in theory, I imagine that's true. Uh-huh. I cannot cite every verse and the Greek grammatical construction to prove that. Right. If if Dr. Anderson was here, he could probably do that in his head like that. <laughs> uh, I can't. Yeah. But but my guess is that's probably a, a, an accurate observation. Mm -hmm. Because again, we're back to the major distinction between justification and sanctification. Right. But some sometimes eternal life can be inherited by work. And sometimes eternal life is given freely, like Jesus at the well, right? That's what that whole thing was about. And sometimes in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Well, maybe right. he's talking about both. Bingo. Mm -hmm. The life you earn, you know, the life is given as a gift first, right. and then you earn the qualitativeness to it later. Justification sanctification no. position condition right. relationship fellowship fellowship you know we're going to definitely link those books there it was just a thought that i had listening to you speak and that's going to be a probably a personal study of mine to look at that aspect so i appreciate that uh, so the last question i want to ask so we talked a lot about free grace theology covenant theology reform positions interpretation and things like that at the end of the day what difference does it even matter if people reject free grace theology, uh, especially key tenets like eternal security and faith alone message, what difference does it even make free grace theology or not? Well, first of all, if you're only saved by faith in Christ, then if you start down the wrong road, you're going to end up not being saved. So it has an eternal consequence if we can get confused too much mm. with the gospel. Eternal security, very important because that helps me have assurance of salvation. So we want to teach people that. But there is a motivational mechanism here from free grace theology. Hmm. Uh, I look at the New Testament, and I see two motivational mechanisms. One is my appreciation of what Jesus has done for me. Yeah. 
I was going to hell and now I'm going to heaven. Definitely. Justification. Mm -hmm. When God got me, he did not get a good deal. <laughs> but when God got you, he didn't get a good deal because there were no good deals to be had. Right. But my appreciation for what he did for me should cause me to serve him forever. Mm -hmm. But there's a second motivation. His appreciation of what I do for him. That is my sanctification, which results in reward. Mm. So you have both justification, sanctification. You keep them separate. They're distinct. If you don't, you have a very muddled theology. It doesn't mean you can't be a Christian, but if you don't have free grace theology, you're very tempted to bring legalism to the table. Mm -hmm. to bring in the law with the gospel. Right. We want to keep them separate. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Separate. You want to call those dispensations? No problem. But they're separated. Right. I'm not under the law. I don't give 10%. Give 9%. Give 11%. Don't give 10% because I'm not under the law. <laughs> Yeah. Free grace theology keeps that distinct. The, the, the reformed theologians, they're not exactly sure what to do with those theological covenants. Right. That's why we have what's called progressive covenantalism, because those are covenant theologians who see the danger of their covenant theology, and they're trying to come up with a new theology without becoming dispensationalists. And so so is it important? It's vital. Yeah, it definitely influences the behavior aspect and how we live and decisions we make. Well, that's uh, why we have to start with our biblical exposition. We then make theological constructs, and then we make ethical application. And as a pastor, that's what we do. We do all three. We teach, we do theology, we give ethical instruction. All three, every week. We could call it interpretation application. I like the interpretation theologizing it and then the application okay yeah that extra step in the middle that sort of marries the two uh i'm gonna lie i i got one last question it just came up in my head and uh why do you think there's so much disdain for free grace theology i think that some of my reformed friends well i know um because i asked one of them i asked dr grudem I said, what do you see as the major problem with free grace theology? And he said, I'm afraid, Fred, that you are giving assurance to people who think they're Christians, but they're not. And I said, well, in your system, that's not a problem, because if God preordained everybody who's going to go to heaven and preordained everybody who's going to go to hell and nobody can change anything, because it's been decreed, then it really doesn't matter if I'm teaching them something wrong, because they're still going to go to heaven if they're bound to go to heaven, and they're going to go to hell, and there's nothing they can do about it. Right. So um, they don't like that idea. They think we believe in cheap grace. We don't believe in cheap grace. No. We believe it costs the Son of God his life. We believe it costs the Father the giving of his Son. We believe all sorts of things we just don't believe I have to bribe God or earn anything from God. Right. And once I'm in the family, I'm in the family. Now, I may obey, I may not obey, but I'm still in the family. No. They're afraid that we are bringing forth a whole movement of what is called antinomianism against the law. Well, we are against the law. We don't live the law. I'm not under the law. I'm under the law of the gospel. I'm under the law of grace. I'm under the law of Christ. Right. Let's talk about those laws. I'm all, in. I'm all in. They also believe we're soft on sin. <laughs> we, we in the free grace movement are anything but soft on sin. Right. When you talk about the Bema Seat and reward theology, you are not soft on sin. You are harsh on sin. But you say what's free is free and what's costly is costly, and we keep them distinct. Right. Excellent. I'm sorry. That, that was just a question that popped into my head right there. And I mean, that's an important question. Around. That's an important question. Yeah. And I think that drives a lot of logical fallacies and straw man arguments and things like that. But so I appreciate your time today, Dr. Shea. And uh, just as we close, is there any final thoughts you'd like to share? Any recommended recommended sources or anything before we close up? 
Well, if you're looking to go to school and you want some, some good theology, come to Grace School of Theology. If you're looking for some books, go to Grace Theology Press. If you're looking for some non-seminary level, but good Bible teaching level, go to the Grace Center for Spiritual Development with Dr. Mark Ray. So we have plenty of resources out there, but it does you no good unless you commit yourself and make the time to study to show yourself approved. Mm -hmm. And if you're a pastor listening to this, let me encourage you, let me exhort you that your job is to feed, lead, and protect the flock of God that he has in in, in given over to your care. So please make sure your theology is right. Make sure you have time to study to show yourself approved. Because one day, Jesus will be asking, why did you do what you did? And you'll be wondering, why didn't I listen to James 3? Yep. Let not many of you become teachers, because you will incur a stricter judgment. Yep. Amen. Amen. Well, again, I appreciate the time you spent with us, Shay, uh, uh, Dr. Fred Shea. And we're going to have links and descriptions in, in the description box there. And so uh, check them out and check out Graceline, I believe it is as well, if I'm not sure. mistaken. Yep. And uh, we'll have it out there. So everybody else, like, comment, share, subscribe, blah, blah, blah. You know what to do. And until next time, God bless.